It's very important to look into yourself. Savitri Devi teaches us that if you just look really hard, you too can manifest uh -huh. what a fear actually is. Uh, yeah. I'm a fear. You're a fear. Yeah. Ray is a fear. Uh. He's a fear in his own little Reich. Yeah. I'm a fear in my Reich. In my Reich in front of me, there is a glass of tea. <laughs> But in Ray's, he's drinking beer. And, and we understand these differences. <laughs> and we manifest them. I think you're actually channeling Saviti Devi. I imagine her as, as a person like that. Welcome to the Empire Never Ended. This is Fritz. I'm joined with Boris and Ray as usual, uh, but uh, we're we're taking on um, a new friend to the show. We have a new guest, a new huh? a new fella, a new uh, freak for our roster. <laughs> Ray's looking around like, "What are you talking?" About? <laughs> <laughs> I brought Matt Carroll. I mean, Ray. he's not that new. We, we were talking about him. Yeah, that's true. In but now we episode. get to do. Now we get to try impressions of him. Yeah. Which I've so been practicing I, for 20 straight minutes. Yeah. So I don't know uh, if you'll use what I already said, but as I just said, this won't be like an esoteric Hitlerism proper episode, as uh, I think we mentioned a few times in our previous episode. It, this will be an episode focused on the New Order, the American mm -hmm. group, and I will just give some brief um, introductions to what esoteric Hitlerism is, because that's what you need to understand what New Order is. Hell so in yeah. a way, it's an end and continuation of the R A and B episodes. Great, good. Because yeah. there's one thing that I wanted to continue and drag out for as long as possible. It's the A and P. This is yeah. kind of what the, in some ways, the fifth A and P episode. The fifth, yeah. We love the A and P. And Fritz is uh, preparing four episodes on William Pierce, which are which is also essentially kind of... four more related. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It never yeah. ends. The A and P yeah. never ends. That's our new podcast name. Yes. Oh. Oh, well, and the pyre, an important ever. group. Yeah. And pyre, <laughs> yes. All right. Well, all right. So, what's today on the empire? Never ended, Ray. We got the new order. Uh, new order. I'm loading yeah. up some Matt Kale impressions. Where do you want to start us off? Well, we'll we'll start we'll start with Savitri Devi, also known mm. as hey. Maximiani Portas. We also mentioned her before many times, and yeah. will again. And we 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 will again. Yeah. This is yeah. So, uh, so this person, Maximiani Portas, better known as Savitri Devi, was born in 1904 uh, in Lyon, France. And she was a kind of a, like a smarty person, we have to admit that. A little smarty pants. Uh, well, in 1928, she got her uh, uh, master degrees in philosophy, and in, th in 32, another master degree in chemistry, and in 36, she got a PhD in philosophy of science. All right, and, that's not nothing. Yeah, and uh, in the thirties, as we mentioned in one of the previous episodes, she she moved to India. Uh, she married there like a pro axis Indian guy. She met uh, like important people in India, like Gandhi and Tagore, uh, like mm. sp like apparently. All right, um, and she became a Nazi in India. Was she nice. well known before she became a Nazi? Do you know? Like, no. How was she received by Gandhi? You know, like how did that happen? I don't know. Uh, I think she was not well known at all. Well, presumably her pro access access partner was in some form or another. Yeah, I think uh, he was in, in the, the uh, uh, in the independence the, in like movement, colonial movement. Yeah. 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 Okay, the axis axis. Yes. Yes. So uh, she um, in India, she came to like um, believe that India preserved ancient Aryan paganism which died out in the West, and how India is the last great country of Aryan civilization. Do you think uh, she went around telling Indians that they were pagan? Because I don't know that they like that. Yeah, I guess. In, yeah. <laughs> but y'all are the best pagans. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so she also, because she became a Nazi at the time, she also believed that Hitler 
is restoring uh, Indo-European Aryan paganism, and that right. his whole movement is about that. She thought he was like an avatar of Vishnu or something, right? Yes, she yeah. she believed that Hitler was a divine avatar, like an, a divine incarnation, uh, who's there to bring about the new solar order in the world. So she wrote a bunch of books. She heavily relied on Hinduist things, especially their like uh, idea of yugas or of this this cyclic view of time and history and how you know it, time can be divided into four different ages which are roughly uh, correspond to more western idea of the golden silver brown, bronze and iron age and according to her and many other people who are into that kind of stuff we today live in the iron age or the dark age or the, uh, the kali yuga um, which is the, the age of inversion, you know, where mm. when like decadence and degradation, where all the true uh, values are inverted. And, Man, uh, when you say roughly corresponds, you really mean roughly, don't you? I mean, we, not a lot of people call this the Iron Age. That's yeah. I mean, he, at this point, you can insert uh, Kale saying how black is white and white is black <laughs> and, and good is bad and bad <laughs> is good and he's very slow like he's really thinking about that that's he's basically describing this idea joe rogan was just talking about kali yuga i don't know oh, if you oh, really? saw that all right yeah uh, yeah he, he so, posted some nazi shit <laughs> yeah well so Savitri devi thought that in this dark age you know you can roughly divide people into two groups of people three groups of people so there are like men in time which which are you know, people who share the values of the Dark Age, then men above time who have the values of a Golden Age, and the most important group are men against time. These are oh. people who are fighting against the Dark Age in order to restart the cycle, bring the new Golden Age, which is what, you know, they want. Isn't the word we usually use for men against time regressive? <laughs> yeah, but this is like, uh, this is the... I think they would agree because this is an anti-progressivist view of history in which, uh -huh. you know, the, the mythical golden age placed in some prehistoric time uh, is the ideal. And right. you want to get there again by, it's basically an accelerationist point of view that you want to bring about this, the current dark age to its end, which will restart the cycle and you will again have the golden age. So, All right. After the, the worst possible age, you have the best possible age. Where all the age the, of Aquarius. Yes, where the, all the true natural hierarchies are restored. Uh -huh. and kind of like what we saw order. with um, religious yeah. Zionism, too, no? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, uh, Nazis are, of course, men against time, and the most yeah. important man against time was Hitler. Uh -huh. And she also saw the SS as an esoteric order. Uh, whose purpose was to restore um, the proper cosmic order, which will be in tune with nature, uh, and through uh, actually to do that through force. Um, okay, I mean, I mean Him Himmler, I think, would kind of agree with that. Yeah, a lot of people would. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, because all of these, you know, attitudes and opinions. And because she really wanted to talk about them all the time and a lot and publish books, she in the West became kind of a, um, a persona non grata, uh, especially because she became uh, an important figure in the post-war national socialist movement, in the neo-Nazi movement, or, although she was really not a neo-Nazi originally because she was a Nazi. She's a regular she was a Nazi. Nazi already yeah. in the 30s. <laughs> yeah. Yes, she is Nazi. Yeah, <laughs> but something, something. So that that was Savitri Devi. The other guy that's important for this story and that we'll talk about more in the future, I'm sure, is a um, Chilean guy called uh, Miguel Serrano. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a guy I've been fascinated with for years and years now. Yeah, yeah. Boris has been trying to convert me to Serranoism for a long time. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. called esoteric Hitlerism. Fritz. Yeah. Well, um, that's why I never joined. I didn't understand yeah. any of it. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, it's not it's not a good name. Yeah. 
<laughs> esoteric Hitlerism. I don't know. Not... It doesn't really sound better in Spanish either. Hitlerismo esoteric, esoterico. Uh -huh. I mean, it sounds the same, yeah. It it's just like it's just a short list of two things that I don't want to read. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> really. Uh, so uh, Miguel Serrano was born in 1917. He died in 2009. So he lived for a long fucking time. Yeah. Um, he uh, was a friend of uh, Jung and of Hermann Hesse, the writer, and he he's mm. most well known because of those two things because he wrote a book about both of these guys. Uh, who I'm not sure if they knew that he was a Nazi while they were friends with him. It's kind of unclear uh, because he wrote a lot of books that were not explicitly Nazi before he outed himself as a Nazi, although he claimed that the whole time he was a Nazi. Uh, so for decades, he was a Chilean diplomat. Uh, he was an ambassador of Chile in countries like Austria, India, and Yugoslavia. Mm, right. So he was an ambassador in Belgrade in the early, in the early 60s. Yeah, you even have a, like a photo of him with Tito, like presenting Tito with a like a gift, like a painting, like, right? Yes, a painting. When he finished yeah. his term as an ambassador, he, he he gifted Tito with a painting. Yeah. Um, in the seventies and eighties, he started publishing his books, and these were like esoteric books, and at first, uh, like New Age books, they were published by like respected. Uh, publishing houses in the West, like Rutledge and Harper and Rowe and so on. Um, uh, so these, these were like New Agey books. And uh, a central thing to all of his books, the ones that are like very openly Nazi and the, the ones that are not so much, you have this kind of, it's interesting because you have this central idea to his, you know, thought and mythology that he develops uh, uh, this is the idea of a male-female union, the, re the establishment mm. of the male-female union uh, as a full, full fulfillment of a um, man, I guess, or a person through this inner union, which I I'll get back to it. Uh, okay. This is this kind of... Esoteric. So far, it sounds like Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which yeah, I love, yeah. so I'm a little uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, I, I would mean, just mention uh, real quick about Serrano is that uh, he ceased being a, a diplomat when Allende came to power. He was ousted then. Yeah, and then but, he yeah. went back to Chile when Pinochet took over. Yeah. But he also found out kind of they were not so much interested in his Hitlery stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, there were some hints in his, like, not explicitly Nazi New Age books that he is a Nazi. Like, for example, mm -hmm. there is this character of a, of a master like a guru there, uh, who he later claimed was an actual guru, like a master that he had in uh, mm. his life, who, who guided him throughout his life. And the master like, uh, was saying things that, you know, there are like people who are less than human, and that they're actually slaves, slaves of Atlantis. Okay. And on the other hand, you have people who uh, preserve some kind of blood memory, for example. So these are kind of mm. books that, you know, were published by mainstream publishing houses in the West in the 70s. Fantastic. Yeah. So in 78, he published his book, The, uh, the Golden Thread. Um, this is Serrano publishing a book, yeah. yeah? Yeah, yeah. He wrote and published this book, uh, the, the Golden Thread. Um, and at the beginning of a book, do you have like a, a photo of Hitler's extended hand, like in the, you know, the Nazi salute, uh, which Serrano uh, describes as a cosmic transmitter of power and uh the, it's an the, antenna that's yes. what it is yeah that's, like that's it. what it is yes all right um and yeah a lot of these things are like just as stupid as they sound so and it's look. an antenna yeah. yeah um and it's a, the, actually the means of ending kali yuga or the um. you know the the dark age and uh going straight to the new golden age so it's it's very he's so kali yuga will kind of, end via the the hand Somehow, uh, yeah. I don't know. You'll see. This is like uh, there's a lot of shit here. Uh -huh. um, so uh, right about this time, he uh, outs his master as a as a Hitlerist because in this new book, uh, master says some things like, you know, Hitler is an initiate, initiate, um, and he knows how to communicate with the astral plane. That's what mm, Hitler I is. See. Uh, this is the beginning of his, you know. Um, public explication uh, of, of what he called esoteric Hitlerism. Um, so, uh, 
He was also influenced by Julio Savola, but he was influenced by almost everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he he synthesized a lot of uh, traditions and new age things that were like popular at the time, but also like Western uh, esoteric tradition uh, and quasi tradition and Eastern as well. So in his writing, you will find, you know, stuff as Atlantis, UFOs, Tantrism, Shambhala and Agartha, telepathy, astrology, runes. I mean, everything is there. And he kind of builds, uh, he kind of builds um, universalist esoteric uh, system, which is kind of strange because he's a Nazi. Um, and he also is really influenced by theosophy. It's kind of uh, more, I mean, because theosophy was very also uh, into racist theories and so on, but this is like an explicitly racist theosophy centered around Hitler. Mm. Uh, sorry, very influenced by uh, Helena Blavatska, but also, uh, you know, through Evola, uh, by people like René Guénon, who mm. were very anti-theosophists and who mm. hated theosophy. But he kind of mixes it all up. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I believe he, he even, um, at some point, um, incorporated, like, uh, Chilean, like, Mapuche, like, indigenous uh, yeah, stuff into his esoteric, well. yeah. esoteric Hitlerism as well. Because he considered them to be the kind of Aryans of indigenous yes. peoples of the Americas. I mean, and during his that time as a diplomat, he, you know, uh, traveled around Europe and met a lot of Nazis, but also, like, a lot of people who, that he was interested in, like Evola, for example. He knew him mm -hmm. personally. So, what Serrano is doing here, really, he's developing a, kind of a new mythology, which is centered around Hitler. And the starting point for it is the end of the Second World War, of course. So, in uh, his view, Hitler and Eva Braun are not dead, mm. of course. Oh. But it's not this old story of them surviving and living in Argentina and then dying in the 70s. They're, they exist on a different plane. So, <laughs> so they're uh, dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they exist in an interior land, Agartha or Shambhala. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are also, not only they are alive, they are rejuvenated. So I guess they are eternally young living there. Mm. It's like a spa uh, for Nazis. Forever young, Hitler will be. Yes. <laughs> and Hitler can be con uh, contacted uh, astrally. Mm -hmm. And to do that is to link with the hyperborean realm of Superman. Uh, that's uh -huh. what, you, what you want to contact Hitler. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, the Fortress of Solitude. And this is, uh, supposedly, this is... Um, symbolized through uh, this whole idea of the tool and black sun and green ray and things like that. Don't ask me what it is. Wait. This is, <laughs> we'll have another, uh, like it's called different uh, episode about it, but okay. tool, black sun and green, green ray somehow symbolize this hyperborean realm of Superman through which you can contact Hitler. Okay. All right. Tool, tool the shitty band or? No, tool like the island of tool, like the, uh... the, the Aryan oh, land of Tool. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, Hitler and the SS specifically, he also has a very, like, the SS are, like, both for Savitri Devi and Serrano, the SS is an esoteric order. An you know, like, esoteric order. Yeah, look, you, if you use a skull and, like, wore black clothes and have some old castle as your headquarters, these weirdos will think that you are, you know, uh, an esoteric order. I mean, it helps to yeah. throw runes on everything, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Put a bird on it! So, um, what Hitler and the SS did, according to Serrano, they generated an initiation into these esoteric symbols that I just mentioned and didn't explain. Um, Thank you. And so, uh, for example, the, the leftward turning swastika symbolizes the involution of the Kali Yuga and the beginning mm. of a new golden age. Mm. Okay. I think it's quite clear now. It is very obvious. Um, <laughs> so, uh, he has a view of world history uh, that is not a conflict, you know, between uh, classes, but a conflict between uh, those who want to transcend, transcend the world. And here you can see how he's influenced by Gnostic ideas, because those who want to transcend the world, and he gives an example of Qatars, the sect that existed in the Middle Ages in France, um, they want to transcend the world 
which is the word of the demiurge or the false god, which he identifies with Jehovah. And the, on the other hand, you have the slaves of this world, which are basically some kind of robots. And this is what he identifies uh, with Jews. I uh, see. Yeah. I was so waiting a, for when the Jews were going to drop in. <laughs> yeah, Jews yeah. are the, the, yeah. the, uh, the, robot, the robots of the false god, Demiurge, or Jehovah. Oh. Okay. Uh, so this is why, uh, you know, Hitler hated the Jews. Um, he, of course, he's a Holocaust denier um, and, and a firm believer in the protocols of the elders of Zion. Okay. Who he thinks is proof that everything he says is true. Yeah, playing the hits. Yeah. He also is into Lucifer, so he, he, he dedicated ah, his work to the, the morning star, Lucifer. Very much into that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, in his view, really, Nazism and Hitler specifically is the culmination of all Eastern and Western religions. He, he like, builds this system that er you know, everything is included, uh, and it ends with Hitler, basically. I mean, you can kind of see how the 09A borrows heavily. Oh, I was thinking about that. Oh, you, you will see even more. You, yeah. you, uh, yeah, you're definitely. about to see even more, like very okay. clearly. Um, so here, again, I will mention this idea of the integration of male and female within oneself, uh, mm -hmm. which he calls like some kind of a magic love. And this is a realization. Magic love. Yes. Um, this is an, a realization of an androgynous inner union. And he also terms this resurrection. <laughs> so the masculus and mulebro. Yes. So in 1991, he published this book, which is very much ONA, called uh, Manu, um, For the Men to Come. And he starts it with this kind of uh, apocryphal um, anecdote of, you know, the last minutes of Hitler in his bunker when some soldier asks Hitler, like, Mein Führer, uh, you know, what are we going to live for uh, when you die? <laughs> and Hitler says, you will live for the men uh, to come, you know. And now Serrano explains to us that this man to come is this Manu. And what is Manu? Manu is the ultimate avatar. I thought this was Hitler, but it turns out it's this Manu guy. Okay, uh, and Hitler's not Manu. So this, well, is, this, is, Manu this, is, coming. Why, this is why I, I say it's kind of, exactly like ONA because yeah. this is like ambiguity about Windex, you know. Yeah. Is Hitler Windex or is Windex someone else? Yeah, or what's yeah, going yeah. on there? Right. Yeah. So this is his mm -hmm. this is Manu. Manu is Windex. Okay. Um so the ultimate avatar, avatar Manu uh will put uh, an end to the cycle of eternal return and to the forces of the dem demiurge. And uh he will you know bring about the restoration uh of man of God Wot Wotan um, mm -hmm. And also, why not the holder of Excalibur and uh, the man <laughs> of Fiora? So, I mean, it's just everything is here, you know. Yeah, he's got it all. Um, and also the re reintegration, of course, of primordial uh, man and woman. Right. That's all what Manu slash Vindex is about. Um, this is somehow, as Boris, uh, I think, I mean, he, Boris mentioned something connected to this. This is um, connected somehow to the continent of Mu, uh, <laughs> which is a part of Lemuria, yeah, which is uh -huh. the continent It's the Mu part of Lemuria. The, 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 yes. <laughs> the, I guess, yes. It's not the Le or uh, the Ria <laughs> part, it's the Mu right, part. Right, it's the Mu, yeah. Um, so Lemuria is beneath the Pacific Ocean, it's, and somehow it's connected to Chile. The book okay. that I read said... It's connected to Chile. Sure. Uh, that's whatever. <laughs> well, uh, Chile is connected to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so, yeah, this is where you can find a clear resemblance to Theosophy. I think the Theosophy was mm -hmm. also heavily into Lemuria and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, theosophy is something that we'll also talk about eventually a lot. Yeah. Yeah, uh, good, because I'm, I'm still pretty unclear on it, and I, you know, really want to get that right, because yes. they sound important, yes. valuable. Well, well, valuable. Uh, yeah, imp important <laughs> to a lot of idiots. Yeah, value. You know, I wouldn't quite say value. Valuable to our podcast, which means it's, not at all. Oh, which means they're terrible yes. people. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. All right. And Hitler is somehow a prefiguration of Manu. So exactly kind of like Hitler is to Windex, I guess. You know? uh -huh. Do you know where he got the name? Like, you know, Vindex was some like minor Gallic general know, or whatever. Manu is some Chilean guy. I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea, but I presume. <laughs> All right. 
So, and also the protocols are, are of course, the authentic agenda of those who serve the demiurge, yeah, who right. are ro- uh, Jews slash robotic slaves. To uh-huh. to to the demiurge. So the the Jews who are usually, as in the protocols, where they're presented as like the pullers of the strings, you know, mm-hmm. like the masters behind the curtain for him. They're mm-hmm. both slave and master of this world, slaves to the demiurge. Well, I guess the demiurge is the master, they are his robotic slaves. So Holocaust didn't happen, but even if it did, it's not a big deal because they're robots. Because they were robots. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think this is the, you know, it's a masterful mythology. It's something. Yes. You could make a religion out of this. He also talks about this point about this magical order and claims that he was initiated uh, in the Tool Society in Chile in the 1940s. It's mm. kind of a strange claim because the Tool was like a relatively marginal, like Tool Society was a relatively marginal nationalist group in 1930s Germany, but somehow he was initiated that in 1940s in Chile, which, okay. I mean, there was mm. a, a large like German um, settler community in, in Chile that existed prior mm. to... Uh, of course, like the Nazis that came, yes. um, and, and like especially in in southern Chile, I believe. Okay, was... he believes that uh, he he claims that he was initiated in the Tool Society in 1940s. So he claims that he was a Nazi since 1940s, but uh-huh. kind of mm. a closeted Nazi. And this is where you know he met his master, who revealed the secrets of esoteric Hitlerism to him. Okay, so like a lot of these you know people, he he met this secret master. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the lady in the else. lake didn't the, happen. Yeah, <laughs> I mean everyone did. All of these <laughs> yeah. people, apparently, all these secret masters are all, all over the place. Just everywhere, yeah, yeah. You can't throw the philosopher's stone without hitting a master in the head. Turn a corner so, in Santiago, and you'll find a <laughs> fucking master, Hitlerist <laughs> master. <laughs> I mean, this could be a great comedy, like yeah, yeah. If we didn't have to live it, he may, meeting some asshole who's like talking bullshit to him, some alcoholic. <laughs> guy and he's believing in everything and it sounds like um, something that charlie would get into yeah you know yes um, uh, uh, yes exactly yes yeah you know what dude hear me out for a second okay now technically that stain did appear to me also i am familiar with carpentry and i don't know who my father is so am i the messiah i don't know i could be i'm not ruling it out so he he like one of his books is dedicated to rudolf hess and he calls him the imam of esoteric Hitlerism. Because, you know, why not? Why not? Why, why not? not? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. He's, uh, you know, you would say he, he uh, sounds like very uh, erudite, you know, because he just, m- you know, mixes up everything there. Yes. A little bit. Yeah. I guess can, it can impress a lot of people like that, you know. So, You know, there's okay. this Nietzsche, there's this Nietzsche line, something like, um, someone who is deep seeks clarity or whatever and someone who wants to be seen deep seeks obscurity i feel like you know nazis they like reading nietzsche but i wonder if they read that as like an instruction you know uh yeah you want to look deep (laughs) here's how you do it so we we come now to our boy finally uh matt kale Uh, Um, i was wondering this was all introduction to matt kale this is all in his head huh so we mentioned him before matthias kale uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Matthias Kale. Shit, um, <laughs> Matthias Kale was born in 1935 in Mil- Milwaukee, and he died in 2014. I think also in Milwaukee. Yeah, he died in, in 2014. Yeah. 2014. Shit. Yeah. Man, but I mean, uh, listen. Uh, you know, Serrano was born in 1917, and he died in 2009. So yeah, good lord. You know, I mean. Uh, Sabiti Devi was like kind enough to die in eighty two or three, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so Kale was the son of Hungarian immigrants of German descent. This is very important. Mm. Yeah. Um, and um, so they're not Huns. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he studied journalism. He was one of these AMP members that like had a like a university degree. At, I think he got it at the University of Wisconsin. He enlisted in the, the U.S. Marine Corps and um, had like two years of active duty in the Marines. Um, uh, already as a schoolboy, uh, our Matt Kale was drawn to anti-Semitism. So um, <laughs> in, um, in 
New York City, he joined the National Renaissance Party of James Madol, yeah. which we'll talk about uh, later a lot, I think. You can also get um, a preview of them from the, the uh, Burroughs episode we did, the Dan yes, Burroughs episode. Yeah. And he was quite active there uh, in the National Renaissance Party. I'll talk about that a bit later as well. I'm, so I'm we're just talking like now... mid-60s? Uh, no, this is like the 50s. Oh, for real? Mm, yes. All right. In the 50s, uh, he already that, uh, joined that. I think in 55, 56, he was already in the uh, National Renaissance Party because in... Um, in '57, he, he joined the United White Party in Tennessee, which was the precursor of the National States Rights uh, Party, which he joined in '58. Okay, okay, well, but, he has but, a solid pedigree. But maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe he was first in the National States Rights Party and then in the National Renaissance Party. I'm not sure. So I think. Uh, Either but, way, they're both big mistakes. Uh, but uh, probably he was first in the Renaissance Party because already in 1960, he joined the American Nazi Party. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then led the Chicago section in 1961. And in 1963, he joined, joined Rockwell at the headquarters in Arlington. And uh, he was the corresponding secretary of the World Union of National Socialists and also the national secretary of the party. Uh, so his duties were there that he, you know, the edited the, the bulletin of the World Union of National Socialists, also the National Socialist Bulletin, which was the bulletin of the AMP. Um, already at the time, the time you could see his, you know, kind of religious tendencies when it comes to Hitler, because he wrote about Hitler as an idealist, a visionary, visionary, a creator of a heroic new worldview, uh, and someone who was all about bringing an Aryan racial revival. Uh, so, in, for example, in 68, he said something like, uh, Adolf Hitler is National Socialism, just as National Socialism is Adolf Hitler. That's his um, thing, huh? He yes. likes to do that kind of thing? Uh, yes. That's is he thing. a situationist? <laughs> <laughs> uh. I mean... You were talking about Hegelian, uh, but this is like a. <laughs> this is not exactly Hegelian because it's just this is tautology. It's uh, it's not dialectic. You would have to have something smart about it. It's just saying <laughs> A is B and B is A. Yeah. This is, yeah. Um, so um, he wrote always as uh, about Nazi ide uh, ideology as a creed and a new faith. Um, so I guess I'm just going to read this because I didn't wrote down where I got it from. Uh, I, uh, I like your kale. Okay. I think it's pretty good. I'm, I know. I think <laughs> I can do it. But he's wrote something You taught like, me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he, he criticized people who were criticizing them, saying that A and B were fighting for some German phenomenon uh, as people who didn't really grasp the truth which Adolf Hitler revealed to the world nearly 50 years ago. So this was his story. And uh, he said, our goal involves far more than the realization of some superficial political or social scheme. It entails a universal transformation of ideas and things and upheaval of unprecedented magnitude. So this is, you know... Hmm. His line of thought already, I think, in the 60s. Uh -huh. So, so what's the implication there that uh, this is one of these, like, we need a total nihilistic revolution type thing? And this is like a, a dumb, like, obscure, like, dumb Nazi talk, you know, like when Nikola Pollock says, uh, well, you know, people don't know what, uh, we're not Nazis because people don't know what Nazis were about. It was much deeper. So we are much deeper Nazis than people think that we are. You know, because Nazism was not just about just political stuff, it's a much deeper thing. You wouldn't understand that because you're too dumb. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um the the party was uh, that he inherited the party uh when uh, Rockwell was killed in sixty seven and became a new commander. And uh, at the time it was already renamed the National Socialist uh White People's Party and he further reorganized it uh, and renamed it as New Order in 1983. At the time, su supposedly it had uh, 200 full members and 400 supporters, mm -hmm. and existed in 18 states. 
is their claim. Um, they didn't do much, the New Order. Uh, they like um, organized celebrations of Hitler's birthday and a lot of lectures and seminars. Uh, Kael also published some texts and books like The Future Calls and uh, Fate of the Future, I think, which he published in 1995, explaining how Hitlerism is the fate of the future. He also moved the headquarters to Milwaukee, his hometown. Mm. Famously, both with a large German population and very segregated. Hmm. Um, Perfect. A, All right. So I want yeah. to find now something for Fritz to read. Okay, but I, I don't know if I uh, understand this philosophy. I'm not sure if I'm looking at the right book, but we'll see. Right. So a good example of, you know, Kale's view of what Nazism is all about is the kind of a party creed that they adopted under him. Um, we believe in Adolf Hitler, the immortal leader of our race, singular gift of providence. Greatest figure of all time, alive in our hearts today and forever. We believe in his holy cause, which is the new order, the fulfillment of Aryan destiny, accordance with the eternal laws of life, the hope and future of our kind on earth. We believe in his movement, the true undivided body of his followers, which bear the name of his cause as an instrument of his will. Consecrated by the blood of heroes and martyrs, the only way to world redemption. Heil Hitler. Bro, well, well, I guess that's what Kale sounds like from now on. <laughs> I, I don't know how accurate that is. I don't think it's very accurate, but I like it. I mean, we were talking about this a little bit before the episode, but like, uh, he, his voice seems to have gone through several different it did. phases. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that has very something shy to do with the. the beginning, you know. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. got a little bit of hand kill at times, and later he sounds a bit like an old, angry Brian Williams. I don't know. He, he jumps it's around It's like a, a Midwestern hand kill. It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. He has weird that, one. like, kind of, um, I don't even know, like, the, the, like, the paw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bo. <laughs> Bo. But, but it's like Hitler. a Midwestern, it's like a Wisconsin propane, version of that. Propane accessories. So, yeah. as you can um, imagine, uh, in his writings and speeches, Kale regularly invokes religious mythology and symbolism, and he is strongly influenced by the uh, Hindu-Aryan ideas um, of Savitri Devi, who he personally knew and corresponded with her like since he met her. Uh, she was in, tight in, with the ANP. In the 60s, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, he also, you know, had, like... Sentences like, Adolf Hitler was born on earth, he became flesh and blood, he fought and he died. <laughs> but, so, <laughs> but every, that could literally apply to everyone yes, in World but War II. <laughs> in his view, Hitler had to die, which is also applies to everyone. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, because this um, emulation was a foreordained, um, a foreordained necessity uh, because uh, in tragic events of 1945 were uh, a cataclysmic precursor of a new world to come. So I guess, uh -huh. you know, this is this thing. He was a, somehow you have like this Nazi messiah, which is Manu slash Windex, but you also have Hitler before that for some reason. Okay. Just All right. To, he's like the, to tease you. I see. Yeah, it's, a, it's how, the appetizer. Yes. All right. All right. How great yeah, it will yeah. be, but then you have like this horrible shit happening to you after uh -huh. that. Uh-huh. And yeah. you, but you know, like you, you're keeping your faith. You're expecting Manu slash Windex slash Hitler, I guess, to come back. Like you had this great thing called Hitler, and then like you know, yes. they ended up sending the hit, like twelve year olds to fight the Russians. <laughs> yeah. it's like the, the children's <laughs> crusade, Boris. The children's yeah. crusade. <laughs> so Kale would write things like Hitler lives in our very own hearts and minds. Our leader is reason. He is reason indeed. So. um <laughs> he he also had like an international following. I'm um, sorry. It's just that their their Jesus Christ was martyred because someone else killed him. Hitler fucking killed himself and then just sort of smoldered in a kerosene pit. Yeah, didn't the Soviets <laughs> supposedly like throw his remains in acid and or like they took his brain and he lives in Shambhala. You peasants. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So in 1991, in a speech to um, New Order members uh, in Europe, he had a little tour in Europe. So he spoke to like Dutch, Flemish, and German Northern members. Um, he connected the end of the World War to the a start of a new dispensation. So he would uh, compare post-war Hitlerism with the early Christianity. So it's like that's um, that's the situation in which they are. You know, like when they were throwing Christian to lions and stuff. Like yes, that. I it's, see. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll go back to this idea but a bit later. Y- you know who did that, though, was the fucking Roman pagans that they're supposed to like so much. <laughs> yeah, but they're not Christians. You know, they are, yeah, right, right, right. right. They're, just, they're, they're just like Christians. So they're, you know, Hitler was not the second coming of Christ. It was the, he was the first coming of Hitler. And now ah. they're waiting for the second coming of Hitler. Ah, uh, okay. Oh. All right. So Christ, I don't know what was that about. But it yeah. wasn't about Hitler. It's just <laughs> similar to that, you know. Yes. Like, they're the early, early Christians, but not really. Yes. Um, also, we use tons of Christian phrases, but uh, not really. Yes. And, uh, so, like the, the early Christians, they seem defeated, but ultimately they will triumph. This is the point of what he's saying. Okay. Um, and how long the, the struggle lasts is not important. Um, and the un- unshakable faith will sustain the Nazis. That's what he's I all about. I think it's probably important to some people that might be yes. Nazi curious. They'd probably like to yes. know how long. I mean, are we talking yes. like a month? No, exactly. The, okay, this is now where he, what he says. It's not important, okay, how long. <laughs> Whatever it takes. 50 years, 160 years, uh, okay, 500 but I got, years, 1,000 years. Though. The important thing is that one day, sooner or later, the cause of Adolf Hitler does indeed prevail on this earth, Kale says. All right. Okay. I guess I'll wait then. So Kale very much hates Christianity. He completely got a, like rid of whole Rockwell's kind of filtration with Christian stuff. Uh-huh. But he still expresses... Um, he still says shit like, indeed he is risen. Yes. He still <laughs> expresses his doctrine, like his Hitler's doctrine... In religious symbols that are Christian is in origin. He so mm-hmm. he, he says things like he is our law and guide as Aryans for all time to come. He is our hope and redemption. Mm-hmm. Okay, which is, sounds very Christian. Very much so. And he also, in, in more specifically, speaks about Hitler's transfiguration and the gathering of a sacred retinue, like apostles. I guess how many of them? Which is what like I don't Eichmann know. And- I bet you anything. There's twelve. <laughs> Rudolf Hess. <laughs> yes. You're going to set up this clip? Well, I mean, you can just read it. Uh, if you read it in the voice, it'll be clear. It'll speak for itself. Uh, yes. Uh, but. Ball. If I catch you whacking in here again, what I'm going to hog tie you. You can, read the, uh, you can read the first one, and then I'll kind of set up the second one, uh, which I'm sending right now. All right. Here we go. I think he's more like a Mr. Anderson than the H- Hank Hill. The proto Hank Hill from oh yo, well, they're so similar but you're right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, he was actually he was also based on a texas uh like a boss that mike judge had in in like yeah. albuquerque and he was but he texas. has he had more of that like um quivering sound <laughs> if i c- 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 catch you whacking in here whacking, but that's the thing is he doesn't like yeah, uh, no, it's carol it's doesn't whoa. total texas yeah he doesn't yeah, whoa. Right. yeah. You're right as the darkness of dying civilization casts its lengthening shadow over a confused and despairing world, the faith of the future will shine forth the resplendent new order guided and instructed by the immortal personality of the greatest figure ever to walk the face of this earth. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he also then talks about <laughs> how Damn, you took some artistic liberties with that one. Dog. Yeah, I'm that's just right. reading that to him. This is I my kale. This is my kale. That's in the, yeah. I think A and P members would agree with you. <laughs> this is why they like on mass left the party after he took over. <laughs> um, so um, he also talks about like what is this world? You know that the, the the winners of the Second World War left us and. It's a world 
you know, of a rat race, consumerism, self-fixation, environmental devastation, pollution, and race mixing. And then he continues. But wait, did they really win if they were, you know, if Hitler is now transcendent? I guess on this plane they won, you know. Mm. No, but, the plane uh, of the demiurge they won. But ultimately... Yes. Yeah. Well, they, they won because of all the race mixing. But right? ultimately, whatever. All right. Well, here's why they won. They altered the national demography and introduced us to integration. Nothing, affirmative action, minority quotas, sensitivity training, black history, and the Holocaust. They gave us permissiveness, drugs, MTV, and teen suicide. <laughs> they gave us yes. safe sex and unsafe streets and gun control. They gave us rock and roll and rape counseling centers. Like, they that's gave a bad us thing. <laughs> rock and roll and rape counseling centers. That alone would be, I would I would start voting if I mean, that was if somebody's only. You want to say only... like rock and roll is bad? What's wrong with rape counseling, rape counseling, counseling centers? centers. <laughs> they gave us alternative lifestyles, sodomy, AIDS, filth. Perversion, chaos, crime, corruption, and dumbing down an insanity of every kind. I mean, what's wrong? Like, I don't know, even from his perspective, like, what's wrong with safe sex? Safe sex. Rape counseling counseling centers. Like, I mean, these are both things that in actually existing national socialism were like a thing. Yes. I mean, like, (laughs) rape was still uh, was a crime. Yes. And and like they believed in eugenics, which <laughs> safe sex He's is a form a part of safe of. sex. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. right. Uh, well, yeah, as we know from the history of Planned Parenthood. Uh, yeah. So, um, so if uh, you know, if a lot of these things that I mentioned about him sound similar to what Savitri Devi or Serrano were talking about, it's because they were it was directly influenced by them. So mm. uh, he was like a like a close uh, well as much as you could be to a guy who lives in Chile friend of Miguel <laughs> Serrano so uh, they corresponded regularly and it is said they were like on calling terms until Serrano died but it is uh, it's digits. interesting that he he in his new order phase and now new order they don't invoke Serrano so much like. They uh, they're like firmly like into Savitri Devi, and she's basically one of the saints. But Serrano not so much. And I wonder why. Maybe he's too weird for them. Uh, but yeah, he knew him and was friends with him and corresponded regularly. But he's not such a big deal, at least publicly not. Maybe it's because he was still alive. Maybe, uh, but they still exist, you know. And they don't mention him. Um, maybe it's just for the initiates. It's like too weird, I guess. I think they maybe no. they think it's like you know, Serrano is into weird stuff that I mentioned. He's into some plasma stuff, and you know, like it's very weird. Yeah, you didn't get a lot of like UFOs from the ANP and stuff. Yeah, really. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think Serrano m- might have also had like too much of the race mix in as mm. like being okay. Because mm. if if I recall correctly, he does be- he did believe that like two master races could mix. Uh huh. Okay. There were two um, master races. Well, he had these like weird ideas about like Amerindian cultures, like indigenous okay. cultures in the U.S. Or in, 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 uh, in, in the Americas, and that like you know there's like some sort of Chilean master race. Oh, and, okay, um, all right, yeah. So on the other hand, like Savitri Devi is really kind of uh, one of the um, um, fundamental uh, persons to maybe the fundamental. Um, uh, individual for Kale's new order, and she well, she was uh, like active, regularly corresponded with Kale. And in fact, in 1982, she was invited by Kale to give like a, a a lecture tour for new order members in the U.S. And she was supposed to um, talk in like give lectures in seven or eight uh, American cities. She was very excited about that, and she. While on her route to travel to America, she stopped by a friend in the UK, her old friend, and she died there in 1982. I was and about then, to say, I thought she died. <laughs> yes, and so yeah. she died just before the, the, the tour organized for her by Kale. 
and then Colin Jordan sent uh, like Tony Williams and two stormtroopers dressed in red there to be a part of the cremation. Tony Williams, mm. by the way, is David Myatt's friend, and uh, he's a, like apparently like a very rich Nazi guy who became the leader of David Myatt's National Socialist Movement after David uh-huh. Myatt resigned just before David Copeland became uh, okay. the nail bomber. So he and he's rumored to have been also a member of the Order of Nine Angles. So he was present in the cremation in eighty two of um, Savitri Devi, and then the inscribed urn with uh, her ashes was sent to Med Kale, and it was uh, placed in the New Order Hall of Fame in Milwaukee, um, apparently right next to the ashes of George Lincoln Rockwell. So they yeah. have both both there in their collection, carefully washed Do, over by. I'm Williams. imagining this in like um like a kind of traditional midwestern like bar you know where they have like somebody's ashes above the bar or something you know milwaukee's like the beer city uh, i heard they made a proper yeah, I, shrine out of the rockwell ashes that so there's like shit around but it, like what know? kind like you know like a they didn't dedicate a building to it it's well, in no. some sort of like shitty fucking like yeah i bet it's in the corner of the like you know whatever afw hall or something and so converted into like a nazi shrine or something yeah (laughs) but instead of smelling like incense it smells like puke yes so um i'll go back a bit in um, history now um and then i'll move forward i'll do this a few times go back and forward in kale's history today all right it's an a causal Um, approach this is a kind of an overview of kale's leadership of uh the Nazi party in the New Order, a brief one, but I'll go back now to his past. Uh, so he's kind of interesting to me because he was, um, Kael was a Nazi before he met Rockwell, and he, right. he was an active Nazi in New York City already in the 1950s, and was a part of a, like a, you know, a Nazi scene in New York City, which had interesting people there, like this quasi- intellectual Nazis, some of which were rich, and some of which were were apparently connected to Nazi intelligence and apparently regularly corresponded with the FBI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, I mean, it it seems like the the most, like, intellectual branch of the American Nazi movement at the time was based in New York City, Yes, right? And also very anti-American. Like, unlike all of these people that we talked about so far, they were very much not into an, uh, Americanism. These were like Nazi mm. Nazis who were gladly like traitors and uh, probably collaborated with German intelligence, like Nazi mm-hmm. intelligence, mm-hmm. and h- hated America, um, so, which is kind of interesting. And Kale was a part of that crew in the 50s already. And it, it shows in a few ways. So Eustace Mullins was Kale's roommate in the 50s. And this guy was a National Renaissance Party's self-proclaimed expert on the Federal Reserve System. Um, but what, what he was, all, uh, he was like a kind of a crackpot, they say. But he was also a poet. And you know who else was a poet? It Tell was me. Matthias Kael. Hey, mm-hmm. well, um, certainly. I mean, we read some of his work here. You know, yes. Very poetic. Uh, Matt Gale was not only a poet, he was like affiliated with a poetry magazine, which was called Chicago Poetry, I think. Um, and they were kind of a part of a poetry scene there. And some, I read somewhere that, that like they were kind of, they had some connection with the beats. Like, uh, hmm. some of the writers that I wrote said like they were part of a poetry scene of which the left wing were, were the beats. So, but mm. they were around mm. there somehow, mm. and they were admirers like this Malin's guy and Kale of Ezra Pound, both of them. Uh, so, okay. yeah. at the time, Ezra Pound was um, uh, well imprisoned in a mental hospital in Washington D.C. And, Unjustly, yes, and well, I mean, it's a mental <laughs> hospital. Uh, we don't support it, I guess. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, maybe it's better that they kill him than you know. Like, <laughs> damn! You can damn. That's got to violate some terms of service. Well, um, I'm just Ray's uh, going Blyberg on these motherfuckers. Discussion. Ray just said we should kill the insane. <laughs> no, I'm saying that he was not insane. He was a fascist. <laughs> uh, so 
Um, so uh, uh, this uh, Eustace Mullins organized um, free uh, Ezra Pound committee, um, and which of he was a president of that, and he was a quite close friend with at the time with Pound and. Matt Kale became um, a treasurer of the group. And so Matt Kale actually knew Ezra Pound and met him like at least twice, I think, and had conversations with him while he was in the mental hospital. And like he just thought, you know, he thought that the Ezra Pound is the best, like he's a genius uh, poet. And also that they were like uh, agreeing on everything. He thought he, he, he saw in Ezra Pound um, a Nazi, basically. And there is even um, uh, you can he, in his collection of books he had a few books that of Ezra Pound that they were dedicated to him and I saw a photo of one and it says to like Matthias Kale Hale Ezra Pound and some date in 1953. Huh. Oh, uh, that's some that's some deep poetry right there. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. I mean Pound was a great poet I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say, uh, and uh, but we, he was a fucking asshole. Like, uh, like <laughs> uh, you know, some people make these some um, mistakes. Like, I think, like Ginsburg, for example, who claimed how uh, Cow Pound renounced his anti-Semitism before he died. There's no proof of that at all. In uh. fact, there is a lot of proof to the contrary, which we'll talk about in our Ezra Pound episode. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that he wasn't a good poet. I mean, yeah, yeah. plenty of shitty people produce good art. <laughs> yes. Um, so at the time, uh, Kale was um, not only an active member of the National Renaissance Party, led by this weirdo called Madol, and we'll talk about the party in one of our. We'll have a special episode just about this group. But he was also the the leader of their kind of brown shirts, which were not called brown shirts. They were called. Uh, security echelon guard and this was like a uniformed security group and actually dan boros was also part of it which is interesting because mm. a lot of these people that kale hated came from the same group that he was a member of like yeah, both yeah, petler yeah. and boros were there which you kind of and they were he and he really hated them and they were later in the nazi party they were in opposing factions right um at the time, Kale was also, uh, like, he wrote for Willis Carto's magazine, Right? Okay. Um, and More about uh, Carto in the next, in the coming weeks here. Yes. Yeah. And uh, f uh, f he went from the National Renaissance Party to the National States Rights Party, which he was probably one of the co-founders. Um, one of them was Rockwell. Uh, so he, he was a kind of a... A relatively big deal, like when you compare him to other people who are members of the Nazi Party, because he, you know, he confounded groups with Rockwell already in the early sixties, uh, late fifties. Um, he was a Nazi before he met Rockwell, connected to this scene in the New York City, which was, you know, connected even to like uh, high-profile, rich uh, Nazi intelligence people. So yeah, yeah. and you know and like he was friendly with Ezra Pound so that and not only with him like there was a whole group of people there uh, who were kind of shady in many ways like there was this guy Vierek who was like a, oh, also yeah. a yeah. poet we talked about Vierek in the America First episode yes that's right yeah, yeah. who's who he was friends with Tesla yeah yeah, yeah. he yeah. was he he's the one that launched but that friends amazing, with like everybody uh, too yeah franking scheme where he turned the uh, Congress of the U S into a free Nazi propaganda outlet yeah that yeah. was vietic i mean vietic was like a like a, a not like a german guy living in america who was a nazi intelligence guy also a poet and he also invented the uh sorry he invented the um the gay vampire oh did he yeah he did and the energy mm -hmm. vampire in the same story that's all him let me just check if my mic is working right okay it's yeah. working baby uh, Turn my headphones up <laughs> so um, uh, but you know, Vienic was like friends with Kinsey, the, the sex mm. researcher. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, he yeah. was like heavily into like, like he's, uh, like in this book that I wrote, he was like, a like organized some like orgies and so on, was very much into that kind of stuff. Vienic um, was down, man. He was down for anything. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. But like, uh, and then you, you see like in the, the, the Kevin Coogan book about Yoki, you, you have a photo of Kale. Um, Vierek and this guy that I mentioned before, H. Keith Thompson, 
together like in the late 1950s uh like in some house party standing in front of a like a portrait of Adolf Hitler which is on the wall somewhere in New York City you know and so who's Thompson H.K. Thompson is also like one of these richer New New York Nazis who I think like studied at Yale and uh, was uh, kicked out of U.S. Marines. Apparently, I looked through his FBI files. He was kicked out for being gay. It seems mm. uh, they say he was a sex oh, deviant, all right. sexual deviant. But uh, he yeah. claimed later if only that he was he, just a Nazi. Yeah. He, he he was a, a, a later um he claimed later and some of his supporters that in 1941 he became an ss major like that he was recruited and but what we know for sure that before the war it, like he was a member of the bund actually oh wow so all right this is, and was a friend and collaborator uh, of uh, francis parker yorkie Okay. Mm. So this guy really mm-hmm. connects a lot of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and he's one of these kind of uh, uh, people in behind, similar to that guy that we mentioned, who was also from York, the D. West Hooker. And I yeah, found right. that both that guy and this Thompson guy pretty much regularly collaborate, uh, uh, corresponded with uh, J. Edgar Hoover. They were like writing uh-huh. letters about subversive groups and so on to him. And, and I, Hoover was popular with Nazis. Yes, and but yeah. Hoover actually li- replied to Hooker, for example. I'm not sure about Thompson, but you mm. know. So I don't know if you know Hooker was just anyone. Why would per- like uh, like J. Edgar Hoover personally reply to him? Um, okay, so I said a lot of things now, um, and I even didn't even start talking about what I wanted to. So. Um, <laughs> uh, so when uh, so yeah, Kale kind of has this very interesting Nazi background in New York City. Um, but uh, um, when Kale succeeded Rockwell as the leader of the American Nazi Party, um, there were problems there uh, because he was in ve- very much a kind of an anti-Rockwell guy. He lacked Rockwell's psycho charisma. <laughs> people, people didn't stormtroopers didn't like that. Drunken psycho charisma. Um, and he was even uh, reluctant to take the the title of the commander, which he was entitled to, apparently, as the leader of the party. So he set for himself like a kind of a, a, a provisional kind of a period for himself in order to see if people will like him. And then after, if they did, oh. they will, he, will, he would assume the title of the commander. Oh, this is so unfure of him. Yeah. Well, like, Commander is a title that Rockwell earned right in the Air Force. Well, yeah. he earned it because he agreed to be stationed in Iceland, you know, <laughs> in the 50s. <laughs> and it became like, it became like, yeah, it became a title. But, but, but Kale, Kale was like a Marine, right? Did, I mean, yeah, like, Kale was a Marine, yes. Which, yeah, which is right. a lot more hardcore than, yes. Like, yes. being like a guy who trains people in the Air Force. You know, yeah, in yeah. Iceland. Um, so it's interesting that one of the ways he tried to establish some authority is that he traveled to Germany, to West Germany, and met with a bunch of Nazi Nazis there. Um, and not only that, but he took pictures with them. So he would like, uh, meet Nazis, uh, specifically Nazis who took, who knew Hitler and had, uh, photos with Hitler together. So in their uh, publication, they would publish uh, like a photo of Kale shaking hands with, for example, Hans Ulrich Rudel. And yeah. then next to it would be uh, a photo of Rudel shaking hands with Hitler, for example. Uh-huh. So the, the, there was a lot of things like that. Um, he met, he uh, met like a bunch of these people there. Um, so... For Do you example, know if he spoke German? I mean, I'm um, not sure. Probably he did. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. Yeah, he was very Germanophile. Yeah. So one of the people that he befriended there was Winifred Wagner, and that was actually the uh, the daughter-in-law of Richard Wagner, who was like a staunch Nazi. So they became friends, and also he was proud, and um, the the whole group was proud that he was the only American that attended. The funeral of Otto Skorzeny, for example. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, no. So that didn't help him much with the American stormtroopers, who really kind of a lot of them split 
uh, uh, and founded their own Nazi groups. I guess some of them we'll talk about later. One of them was was surprise, surprise, led by a, like a pedophile. Oh no way! <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, that's another story. Um, another problem for for him was that there were uh, persistent rumors of his homosexuality. Mm. Um, now, this was connected, uh, I think, to this whole New York Nazi scene, the decadent New York Nazi scene. I see. Because, you know, you had people there like Thompson, who was also kind of, kind of supposedly kicked out the Marines for being gay or something like that. Um, so that was, that was a big problem for him. Um, and now this is where we go back to our old friend, uh, Cooper. Ah, Cooper the Pooper, he ran. He, I'm so glad he keeps coming back. He he really does, yes. Great. Um, I think He's this my was new like, favorite uh, freak. This was the Nazi war of who, who will accuse whom of being a worse uh, sex decadent, like, deviant. <laughs> no, Cooper so, will take the cake. So I think, like, <laughs> maybe he wasn't even, like, uh, like uh, into that stuff, because I now, I now know why they said that. Oh, um, really? Yes, because he, he was one of the people who wrote about how Kale, how Kale was gay. Um, huh. uh, so, so you think this whole thing about him digging through trash and getting off on eating I shit? I mean, I don't is... know. I hope it's true. I, I, I really do want too. it to I, really be, I want to believe <laughs> in Cooper the Pooper. But um, <laughs> so in the National Socialist Vanguard report in 93, okay, this is decades after the fact, that's Cooper's um, magazine, if you can call it that. Uh, uh, you know, he, his um, his stormtroopers were actually called Pooper Troopers. Okay, in the Little Pooper Trooper report. He he writes about uh, the history of the National Socialist White People's Party, and he said that um, after Kale was chosen as the leader, there was a group of concerned sympathizers in the New Jersey area who were, they were concerned about these rumors of, uh, of Kale being a, a gay guy would backfire. So what they did, they uh, one of them, who was called Winfried de Kernbach, uh, in 1970, he approached William Pierce, and William okay. Pierce was a close collaborator uh, of Kale at the time. Uh, he was, um, I think, a national secretary, and that other guy Lloyd was a national organizer. So the party, kind of in the beginning, it was functioning well because there were these two guys who were relatively competent, Pierce and Lloyd. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but these people yeah, are both very qualified and like intellectuals. Right? Yes, yeah, yes. we'll hear all about them on Monday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So William Pierce uh, was approached by this Jersey guy uh, to warn him about Kale being gay, um, and he supposedly gave him some evidence that was stolen from an ADL member who infiltrated the National Renaissance Party ten years before that. Okay, uh -huh. um, and then Kale. Uh, then Pierce tried to force Kale to res resign, but Kale didn't, and he kicked out Pierce after the party, and not only him, but also Lloyd. And it is said now by New Order people that Pierce later regretted, uh, they don't mention any of the gay stuff, they said, they said that he tried, tried to take over the party from, or, yeah, the party at the time, party, uh, from Kale, but uh, he was kicked out, and he later regretted uh, he, this attempt. Mm -hmm. So now, like New Order people are like, they talk good uh, about national. Wait, was this years. was this kind of okay. like a huh. um, ANP Night of Long Knives or something? <laughs> right. I mean, because wasn't that whole thing with like Aaron Strum, yeah. Rem or whatever Supposedly, about yes. some homosexuality? Or, yeah. Well, there's like actually, the Night of Sporks, probably. There is actually a direct connection to that, which is interesting. But uh, yeah, I just want to say that uh, 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 according to New Order people today, uh, uh, Kale and Pierce were on speaking terms by the end of the seventies again. Uh -huh. Okay, so they were like okay. Um, but um, uh, there was um, another thing here, uh, and that's the. Let me find this. Sorry. Mason hated him forever, though, right? Yeah, he he thought that he was a dork. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Mason keeps the grudge, though. He yes. does. <laughs> Mason never backs down. I mean, uh, down so, to where, um, you know. <laughs> at the same time, uh, like, one of the reasons why these rumors were persistent, like, apparently to Kevin Coogan, who, who published this book about Yoki, I, I didn't mm. manage to find this myself, so I'm citing his book. 
So the uh, Kale's National Socialist White People's Party had like an expensive looking national, like a, a magazine journal, which was called the National Socialist Review. And its mm -hmm. first issue, they had a, a longer text which was titled National Socialism and Eros. Um, apparently, according to Coogan, the text identified Hitler as a homoerotic man. No way. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, praised this guy called Hans Blucher um, as a, like a proto-Nazi. And uh, this guy, Hans Blucher, was, um, he was in the uh, 1920s, he was a member of the Folkish movement. Uh, mm. There uh, and of the proto hippie Van der Vogel movement, but he was a uh, like a in the pro Nazi branch mm. of that movement. Mm. Great, and apparently Nazi he hippies now. He had a positive view of pederasty, uh, mm. and he saw it as something that like uh, uh, is good for relations uh, among men in some way. Makes them. Oh, it's a Sparta and, thing. Yes, kind of yes, it's like yeah, macho, okay. macho yeah, right. stuff, you know. Uh, well, I mean, we have that today among some alt-right people who are like, you yeah. know, not gay. They just have sex with men, but they are definitely not gay. No, they're um, appreciating each other's masculinity. Yes. Uh, for aesthetical reasons. Of course. Uh, so, um, and, but apparently this blue hair guy, although he thought that pederasty was good for men, he also thought that um, Aryan men much sub, uh, like... Uh, sublime his homoerotic impulses uh, in order to accomplish his ta task of culture building. So I'm not sure, exactly sure what, what was his opinion. On, is that, like, should you have sex with men or not? I'm not sure. It sounds like a no. Uh, but uh, this text has a positive view of this guy and, and uh, recommend his book, The Role of Erotic in the Male Community. They would have loved the Ottoman Empire. Mm. Like, yes. The 16th century. <laughs> <laughs> um, he uh, so Kale also uh, tried to, um, as I mentioned earlier with his Euro tour, he tried to maintain these uh, international relations. So he really uh, he still worked on the maintaining the World uh, Union of National Socialists. So uh, one of his closest contacts was this Danish Nazi called Povel Ries Knudsen, who he appointed to be the general secretary of Wunds. Was um, he now the head of Wunds, or did it go to Colin Jordan? Uh, uh, well, I don't know. He was the general secretary. I don't know what they did at the time. Uh, well, they had, a, they had like a dual commander thing, right? So I guess yeah. that's out. So I don't know yeah. what, maybe they changed these things. So now he was, I guess, the general secretary. Okay. According to some sources, this guy was first close to Kale, but then he didn't like all the religion stuff. But I saw also that this uh, Knudsen guy was very influenced by Savitri Devi and uh, is now cited by the new leader or new order as his friend. So maybe it was a falling out and then they made up again. I don't know. But it well, it seems like you can be influenced by Savitri Devi and go into like any possible direction. That's yeah. true, yes. Even yeah. more so if it's Serrano. But uh, yeah. he said something like, uh, yeah, when I was there, like with these uh, New Order people, like everyone was crazy. Like there was like, like, you know, something like that. This Danish guy said, like, there was like not a, not a lot of, he said something like not a lot of normal people or something. Like <laughs> but I guess now they're all friends again. Um, so, uh, when he, uh, uh, when, uh, Kale established new order, he also made a, this compound commune in New Berlin, Wisconsin, uh, which was like dedicated entirely to worshiping Hitler. Um, uh, so that was perfect. That he did town name for them. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, for sure. And, um, I'm sure they didn't have like an Albert Speer to build them like cool architecture there's just like a, another place in wisconsin that <laughs> it's called new berlin i'd like to see his plans for making it new germania yeah, yeah exactly this, like, podunk town <laughs> <laughs> nice so when william pierce was kicked out from the party by kale he joined the competitive group of willis carto which was called the national youth alliance um excuse me he quit as yeah, i will cover quit, on yes. monday yeah Mm -hmm. And this is where we got the National Alliance from. As a, you can't fire me. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm now, I guess, coming to the end of this fucking episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, 
um, the new order exists today. Uh, and uh, I will go through, and he, they have a new leader because Kel died in 2014. They didn't do much. They uh, became, they styled themselves as a vanguard party. They were uh, like, no party, a like group. They were no longer a mass uh, organization, which yeah. they defined the National Socialist White People's Party as a mass group because they had oh, like really? 100 All members. 20 of them. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> like maybe at some point 100. Now they well, are I mean, Mason group. made this distinction too about, yeah. about all this. Yeah. Because now they have uh, five members, which you will be able to see on our Instagram. So they do things yeah. like you will be able to see on our Instagram which is commemorate Rockwell's assassination in front of the, in like, in, like in the mall that he was shot. So a bunch of old people go there, like not a bunch, five of them go there and they commemorate this thing. <laughs> um, and they worship Hitler. So that's what became their thing. But according to them, actually... Um, <laughs> it's more of a monastic order. Really. Yeah. But they actually, um, they have this, I read through their own, because they have a new <laughs> uh, leader now called Martin Kerr, and he writes a lot of stuff. Uh, um, and he, he's kind of a, an interesting guy, um, uh, also a member of a lot of these groups. Um, so I went through a few things that he wrote. I will just uh, like say a, bit, a, a few of his biographical uh, thingies first. So this <laughs> new leader, I don't know, he, he seems that he doesn't call himself commander any, uh, also. Maybe he's also relu reluctant, like Kale, but I guess uh -huh. he's entitled to be the commander of the new order. I think he calls himself uh, something like national organizer or something like that. I'm not Why sure. don't these people take the crown? I don't know. So Martin Kay was born in 1952, and uh, he was born in Pennsylvania. And when he was three or four years old, he's not sure it was three or four, uh, okay, his right. family moved to New Jersey, and he went. Uh, he lived twenty miles uh, from New York City. And in 1966, uh, when he was 14, uh, he read an interview with Rockwell, and he was amazed by it. So it's kind of similar, like Mason. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to be a member of the Nazi Party, and he wrote to them and became, through correspondence, the member of the youth uh, group of the Nazi Party. But his parents wouldn't have it, and they didn't allow him to be a member of the Nazi party. But uh, by his junior year in high school, uh, he started attending in New York City uh, like demos of the National Renaissance Party, and he became mm. an active member of the group. Um, I think... Uh, and uh, uh, while being a member of the National Renaissance Party, he knew Madol, and he writes about at all and various things about him in the 60s uh, like, uh, well yes in the 60s uh, while being a member of the National Renaissance Party in New York he met Matt Kale uh, for the first time and this was actually in the 1970 and he describes this how he met uh, um, Matt Kale um, it was in the uh, Madol's Manhattan apartment slash headquarters of the National Renaissance Party <clears throat> and Kale his mom's house. Yes, his mom's house. Yeah. Um, uh, Kale visited the department because he was visiting New York City because there was an exhibition going on uh, of um, like architectural sketches made by Adolf Hitler. So he and two other Nazis visited New York to see that, and they visited their friend Madol in his uh, his mom's house, and this is where the, they um, met. The young Martin Kerr and, and Kerr was like impressed. He fell in love with Kale. Kerr was in love with Kale. Gotcha. Um, this was 1970. So in 1971, he he says he rejoined the Amer uh, the National Socialist White People's Party because he counts that he joined when his parents banned him when he was a kid. I see. So mm. so he re rejoins in 1971, um, and uh, he 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 he. he uh, from then on, he was close uh, to Kale. He moved to Arlington, uh, was in the headquarters there, and uh, became the editor of their party publications, um, and was later named uh, as Kale's successor in his will. And he went through all of these transformations of the party to New Order and uh, things like that. Um, so I went through like uh, the history of the party according to Martin. Um, and so, so he writes how, um, you know, some of these things that are like 
well known, how Rockwell renamed the party nine months before his death, so Kale already inherited a renamed party. He was, at the time, very young, 32 years old. He was quiet, introvert, um, and um, people didn't like him. <laughs> this is like what's the official history of New York. Because he could read. Yeah. Uh, 32 is not that young to yeah, take yeah, over of course, a political yes. party. I mean, it's younger like than pretty Rockwell normal was. age. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it was also like uh, a bad time for the party because they lost all of their all of their like uh, real estate. They were evicted. So, but he managed, to, and there was a lot of splits. Uh, mm. It was a bad time. Rockwell died. There's this dog who is the new leader. He doesn't even have the guts to call himself the commander. Uh, but he uh, he managed to purchase uh, like a small building and made a new headquarters out of that, and then. He published, in, uh, uh, Kerr says, an impressive hardcore edition of White Power, which was the first like posthumous edition of the book written by Rockwell. And he opened even a bookstore in Arlington. Um, and this is the time where his you know, two closest collaborators were William Pierce as the national secretary and Robert Lloyd as a national organizer. So things were going, going well. And in 1969, they even had their first ever national congress. So first ever national congress of the party happened after Rockwell died. Um, mm. And they had apparently uh, 120 delegates there. And this is where he finally was brave enough to assume the title of the commander, which he did. So wait, this is, uh, Mason would have been here by then, right? Uh, yes, yes. Mason yeah. was with him. He was loyal at the time. Mm-hmm. And you even see, you can even see these uh, you can even see Tomasi and some of the photos mm-hmm. of right. these mm-hmm. um, conferences and so on. Um, so, but he didn't have luck for a long time because in 1970 the William Pierce coup happened. They don't mention any of the gay stuff there. Uh, they just say that he wanted to become the new leader, uh, and then he kicked out Pierce and Lloyd, and then they were later sorry. That's the official history. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> Then there is a, like a touching uh, part of this history, how he always compared himself with Rockwell, and he was so shy. He was all, always uh, reading texts and was ne- never would look up and was totally not charismatic and so on. But he had other qualities, and in time he realized how you, you, know, you can be your own Führer and your own kind of a leader <laughs> of the American Nazi party. You don't have to uh-huh. be Rockwell. You will always right. be a poor imitation if you try to imitate him. You can be Kale. So it's a very positive story. All right. Yeah. Of becoming a strong uh, Nazi leader on your yeah. own terms in time. Yeah, it's very just changed. Getting, uh, too. Empowering. A story of empowerment. Yeah. To get in touch with that inter- inner Nazi. Yes. I think uh, esoteric Hitlerism will probably help him a lot with that. Huh. Esoteric Hitlerism is just a way to manifest this, <laughs> yes. destiny, inner fear. this, this, this inner fear that we all have inside of us. Yes. Wow. Some of us can manifest it better to become a real fear. So I, I think the, this idea, I, I detect, like, although they praise, like, these New Order people, they praise Rockwell a lot, and they use his imagery and so on. But I de- really detect a lot of passive aggressiveness towards Rockwell in what they write. Okay. Which, uh-huh. kind of, maybe they killed him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, because they always, like, very favorably compare Kale to Rockwell. Like, all the time. So, for example, uh, they say how really he really kind of rejuvenated the party. And Mm -hmm. how they had headquarters and bookstores in major U.S. cities, like in Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Los Angeles, St. Louis. Um, And uh, he he, he had a kind of a cadre party that, uh, like, the the only uh, dedicated people got full membership of it. So uh, when they peaked in 1970, early, like mid-1970s, they had like 600 official supporters and 100 on probationary kind of status. And they had 200 stormtroopers. I guess the 200 are the, the full members and the others are like semi-members. I don't know. I see. But um, uh, they are very proud that at this time they would uh, manage to do marches with 50 to 100, with 50 to 100 stormtroopers, which is, and they uh-huh. say something that Rockwell was never able to do. Like Rockwell had at most 20 stormtroopers per event, and at like a few occasions, they even had like up to 100. 
Um, and you can see actually the pictures of uh, like uh, Mad Kale with the stormtroopers, and it does look more organized mm-hmm. than Rockwell. Mm-hmm. They, they, their uniforms are more uniformed, I guess. Yeah, okay. And, um, <laughs> and they look more like, all, like an org- organized group, and there is a lot of them compared to the, with I mean, the pictures. I mean, Rockwell before. was just like completely shit faced. Wearing yes. aviator sunglasses like during the daytime because yes. he was way that's all charisma. Yes. That's and, right. That's and, right. Yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> but you know, also it was all about him, right? Mm. And uh, this guy, Kale, can't, you know, he can't really make himself into a Rockwell. So no. better focus on the fundamentals. So they are very proud that in 76 and 77, they even uh, were a part, I guess, because they um, just went there, but they were a part of the. The annual Arlington Fourth of July parade. Uh, mm-hmm. So they just went there with u- uniformed stormtroopers and like drummers and a flag bearer and were a part of the parade. I don't know if they got some <laughs> permit for that, but they were there. And they say even All now, right. like in hindsight, this like looks amazing. Like you could never do that now. But that that was the like they their peak. They were like doing that, and they were like brag <laughs> how they have you know fights with communists and Commander Kale was also part of that. Like in fights, and he was very brave. He never to like sent his troopers to fight if he didn't go by himself. And or to blah, dig blah, at Rockwell. Blah. Yeah, yeah. I probably, I think, yes. Also, another passive aggressive dig at Rockwell. There's yeah. a lot of that stuff there. Uh, and also in 1975, according to them, they started uh, running in local elections, like in, mm. uh, for example, usually for school boards and for mayors. And the biggest amount of votes they got was in 1977, Milwaukee race for school board. So the uh, two female members, both called Sandra, one called Sandra Anders, and one called, by the way, Sandra Osvalic. So another Hugo there. Uh Uh, They got a lot of votes. And uh, uh, according to CARE, each of them got like about 20% of votes. And this Sandra Anders got over 7,000 votes, which is more... And Rockwell got in his around oh, for yeah, gubernatorial. Yes, uh, yeah. and she, mm, yeah. uh, according to Care, uh, the Sandra Andrews were like uh, was three hundred votes sh- uh, short of being elected. Damn. Um, and, and if you Google now Sandra Oswald, you actually get an, an information that some Sandra Oswald donated money to Trump. So uh-huh. I don't, I don't interesting. Know that's the same person, but it's there. It's almost certainly the same person. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also at the time, uh, it was very obvious that Kale really was much more strict at, um, uh, maintaining this original Nazi style than Rockwell was. He, and this is also in these explanations where you see this kind of, that they look down to Rockwell really, although they praise him. And they say how, you know, Rockwell was kind of, he had his kind of dumbed down version of Nazism. He thought it's only important to have a swastika and uniform people. That's it, you know. Um, right. And Kale was not about that at all. So, for example, he completely dropped the line about uh, championing or defending Western Christian civilization or something like that. He was totally mm-hmm. not into that at all. Um, in 1980, they wrote a new program. So already there we have this Martin Kerr, who is now the head, as the main guy next to Kale, because the, out, the, the people who wrote the new program were Kale and Kerr. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was kind of an introduction into the new order. This was in 1980, and they outlined uh, like a program for how to turn America into a proper Nazi state, basically, in a more detailed way than Rockwell ever did. And in the same year, Kell uh, wrote a book, uh, no, a text which was called The Revolutionary Na- Na- uh, Nature of National Socialism. And they say this is you know, significant because um, he, in this uh, text, gave up on this idea of rescuing, uh, rescuing Western civilization. And mm-hmm. um, he basically said that Western civilization was already dead. And what Nazis need to do is prepare the grounds for a post-Western Aryan civilization, which is something we heard before from Mm -hmm. a few other people. Sure, yeah. Um, But, so everything seemed that it was going well, but at the end of the 70s, they say they had a decline in the party. Uh, They blame Reagan for that, who was (laughs) elected in 1980. 
they said like uh, the Americans were fooled, you know, that he's like a right winger, that he's like a like a white nationalist, would will be better for white people and so on. And so party membership dropped, I guess, because they became Reagan supporters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and their donations declined, and uh, they also had problems with IRS and such things. God, it's really amazing how everything in America gets funneled into the two-party system one yeah. way or the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so already, uh, bef- like in the 70s, he kind of, uh, Kale didn't really think about taking power. That was not his priority. He was organizing the party and wanted uh, the party to grow. But uh, in the early 80s, he started qu- really questioning the whole idea of, you know, taking power under the banner of National Socialism. So he wanted to, uh, you know, some people who are Nazis, they when they uh, see it's a problem to be, you know, take power when you're an open Nazi, go in the National Alliance way of not being completely open about your Nazism. But uh, Kale also realized this is maybe not possible, but then he went into the other direction of giving up the idea of taking power and remaining a true Nazi. Because the Western uh, civilization is dead already. You cannot save it. Uh, and not only that, even if, uh, he, he thought, even if um, they would take power uh, somehow by some miracle, the basis of the Aryan society was so infected and, uh, you know, degenerate that even, uh, like, with all of these uh, spiritual values being completely the opposite of what they are, you know, black is white and yeah. blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, this whole story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that even if they took part, uh, took uh, power, uh, they wouldn't be able to construct a proper national socialist state. It's so bad. So there's no really any point in doing any of that. So what they should focus on is laying the foundations for a post-Western Aryan civilization. Uh, um, and how should they do that is by constructing this new religion, the Hitlerist religion. He doesn't call it esoteric Hitlerism, he just call it, uh, calls it Hitlerism. Um, and this is why in January, on January 1st, 1983, they dissolved the National Socialist White People's Party and reorganized it as the new order. Um, with a spiritual or religious focus, as they say. Uh, the idea. Was Sorry, to- do you know if they um, if they registered officially as like a church or something? I don't know. I, I, I know probably that Pierce did, yeah. Pierce did something. I was just like that. thinking about cosmotheism. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They have like if you go to the New Order website, they have stuff on Pierce and cosmotheism. Okay, so I guess mm. they have some kind of rela- friend, friendly relationship to that. I don't know exactly how. I didn't research it. Too much. Mm, mm. Um, so they wanted to establish a new religion for the uh, the Aryan humanity, as they call it, um, as the basis for this future civ- future civilization. This was very unpopular, according to themselves. This was very unpopular with the membership of the National Socialist mm. White People's Party. So many of them left. It was like an exodus, they say. Uh, but <laughs> Kale- did they say exodus? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Kale was convinced that he was right. He's just uh, the realest Nazi in America. That's, yeah, that's the burden he has to carry. So um, the so New Order group today is led by this Martin Kale fellow, um, who was named in Kale's will as his successor. Hmm. Uh, so he has direct lineage, you know, to Rockwell. Official um, legal lineage. Enshrined yes. in a will. So I just wanted... To, he gave an interview in 2018. Um, so the question of these Nazis to him is, uh, different people have different definitions of national socialism. By the way, this I have to say, this care guy, he, he became uh, famous when he was a Nazi student among Nazis because he, while well, he was at university, he, he will, would hang a Nazi flag on the... Like, the window his room or something like that and it was even in like in the me- national media or something like that and then the university made him take it down or something like that so yeah a dork yeah and um so the question is different people have different definitions of national socialism what does it mean to you and he replies there are different levels to national socialism what most people understand by the term 
is its superstructure. Mm, okay. That is to say, its outward policies and form. In that sense, National Socialism is a dynamic racial movement that seeks to safeguard and advance the interests and welfare of white people, both here in the US and worldwide. Uh -huh. Using Hitler's Germany as a model, the New Order seeks to create a National Socialist state for white Americans. Now, it's not the case that we are trying to replicate the Third Reich on American soil in the sense of copying it identically in every little detail. Rather, our goal is to apply basic National Socialist principles in an American context, taking into account American history, its racial and ethnic demographics, and its geography, as, as well as the unique character of the American personality. And then he says, National Socialism is a worldview, uh, or a Weltschauung, how do you call it? Eh? Yeah, uh, yeah. To use the German term, we believe that the universe is governed by natural laws. For man to be healthy and prosperous, he, mu he must first acknowledge that these laws exist. Secondly, he must discern what they are. And finally, we must follow them. Why, if they're natural laws, would you have to acknowledge that they exist for them to be <laughs> yeah. real? So then he says, uh, uh, <laughs> his uh, response to... Uh, what does separate uh, New Order from other groups, pro-white uh, pro groups? He says, the New Order is a vanguard national socialist organization. Our doctrine is derived directly from Mein Kampf and other Hitlerian sources. Here is what we are not. We are not white nationalists. We are not white separatists. We are not alt-right. Mm -hmm. We are not bulk right. We are not Christian identists. We are not Satanists. We are not identitarians. We are not not national Bolsheviks or stash rights. Okay. Our, our goal is to promote strict, hardline Hitlerian national socialism and not something else. We try to stay on good footing with other pro-white groups that are not national socialists and we wish them no ill will. Anything that moves white people in the general direction of national socialism is worthwhile in our opinion. But ultimately, there is only one movement qualified to lead white people into the future, and that movement is National Socialism embodied in North America as the New Order. So they are, Damn. They are the, the party, uh, yeah, although they are the not the party. Most Nazi. Yeah. He gives a little bit of uh, the whole history, kale, blah, blah, New Order. And the last thing that I wanted to read <laughs> is the question, his answer to the question, uh, what is the New Order's stand on religion? He says... The new order is incorporated... Uh -huh, so this is the, the answer to Boris's question. The new order is incorporated in Virginia as a non-profit religious organization. Our leadership views national socialism as our religion. For us, the tenets of national socialism worldview fulfill all the spiritual requirements for a new religious faith. Sometimes people refer to it as the Hitler faith or esoteric Hitlerism. Our critics sometimes claim that we worship Adolf Hitler as a god, but this is a misunderstanding or deliberate distortion of our belief. Our well, founder, actually. Yeah. Our father, uh, our father, our founder, Matt <laughs> Kale, put our perception <laughs> of Adolf Hitler as follows. Maybe you, you can read this now. Oh, shit. Matt's coming back. For the end, yeah. M -m 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 Matt Kale, Kale, Kale. <laughs> there is but one supreme being. One I like that you gave him a lisp. <laughs> well, I think it, I don't know. You know, it evolved. It evolved into this guy. Uh, I think it's his spirit is who's speaking here. Yeah. There is but one supreme being, one ultimate source of all causation, one great primal power, infinite and eternal, which we recognize. We are all creations of this power. Once in a thousand of years, however, a singular and unique figure appears, whose special mission it is to declare anew the divine will and to redefine human history. In so doing, he himself becomes a universal symbol. In recent time, this extraordinary providential figure appeared in the person of Adolf Hitler. With his miraculous appearance, a new age of Earth has begun. That is why we honor and revere him. <laughs> okay, so I, I will end with this. Uh, so, you remember how these people were like the, the vanguard the revolutionary group? And how they were li like the early Christians being persecuted yes. today, suffering today for a new future. And how could I forget? It doesn't matter, whatever it takes, you know, we'll suffer through it and whatever. So this Martin Kerr, he likes to write his personal 
history and Nath is asking question and he likes to answer. So I take note of one question. Uh, some Nazi asked him like, um, was he ever persecuted by the cops when him and his organization were mm. distributing Nazi literature and so on? Uh -huh. And he answers like, so this is the guy who was Nazi since the 1960s. And he said, um, this happened so rarely that I remember every instant of it. And he, re <laughs> uh, and he, uh, there were four, four of these uh, <laughs> four incidents. Times. Yes. <laughs> it happened in 1970, 1975, 1977, and 1980. So since okay. he's 1980, this guy didn't probably, basically didn't have any problems with cops. Um, this persecuted, you know, yeah, yeah, just Christian, like the early Christians, yeah, anger, yeah. revolutionary, yeah, yeah. Who, the Romans just, stopped by once every take five years takes. to check in on them. <laughs> so these are the four instances. In 1970, they were like leaflate, leafleting, leafleting, leaf, yeah, leaf, leafleting. Um, <laughs> and a cop showed up, and he was a, a young guy, I guess, and he took him to the police station and then let him go. That this was the <laughs> per persecution of 1970. Uh, five years later, 1975, the, um, so there were uh, a bunch of them were distributing uh, a newspaper door to door, and a cop showed up and took personal information from them and told them to go home. And they just Damn. waited for the cop to go away and then they continued to do their. Oof. Oh, <laughs> so how did he get over that? That's the horrible incident of 1975 that she's this like, a you know. It's brave man to keep going deeply traumatizing to him yes he remembers every detail of it <laughs> i mean there's only two details so <laughs> yes. in 1977 there was listen to this there were like three dozen of uniformed stormtroopers who were <laughs> uh, like distributing a, a, a newspaper called white power door to door in a working class neighborhood in detroit uh so what did happen Cops showed up and told him to go away. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. Help, help, I'm being oppressed. Ah, now we see the violence inherent in the system. Yes. yes. <laughs> and the, the, the last example is the most scandalous one. It was in 1980. They were again distributing the white uh, power newspaper door to door. Then a female officer showed up, um, took, took personal details from them, uh, they were really kind of now uh, you see they they will start talking back I guess because it was a woman. Okay. Um, so they challenged the officer uh, and said that she was harassing them, uh, and she said, "Okay, whatever, just go away, please." Um, and then <laughs> later they went for a coffee and they were like totally pissed off, like, "Can you believe what we are like going through?" So what did they do? Like all revolutionists, they went to the police station to complain. Ah, uh, um, yes. And yes. they, uh, they uh, uh, asked for the watch commander who showed up and they, they said how their free speech rights were violated and so on. And the cop said, okay, whatever, just go away. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. So this is, you know, this is just like the early Christians. Oh right? my God. Yes. Yeah. The persecution. I, uh. I mean, isn't that proof that they are right? Speechless. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. They the live. They, they live in this really, world yeah. as complete entities as to whatever. Pretty. To, to yeah. Everything they believe, and right. this is you know this is what you have to be ready for to get. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Pretty um, much. <laughs> man. Well. <laughs> uh, yeah, that ought to be our our uh, our longest, but not saddest episode. There is. Uh, there is a. Uh, it's a it's a happy tale, like you said. You know, it's a positive story. The Nazi found himself. You can overcome your stayed real. Yes. Yeah. Find your own way to be a Nazi. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I don't know if I'm gonna really try, but I'm glad to know mm. that it can be done. It's not that you too can become a fear. Yeah, if I wanted to, you know, but I don't really want to. Uh, yeah. I I never actually thought about the fact that um, Savitri Devi had a French accent too. Mm. I, I I have no idea what accent she had. She was like a Greek, French person lived in India, spent a lot of time in England. No idea. Do you know that like later in her life when she was living in England, was she still with this like Indian guy that was pro access? He's not mentioned at all. I think he probably died a long time ago. Yeah, because I mean, it would have been kind of awkward in the whole like packy bashing yes. phase yeah. of things to be like, 
Yes, I love South Asia. Yeah. <laughs> it's the last Aryan country. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, you have like Charlie Sargent. Like. Yeah, just thinking. <laughs> Charlie Sargent's always like, he's yeah. always the other one. <laughs> he's always the counterpoint to all this, all this stuff. Uh, but you must understand that Hitler is a Vishnu. Hmm. <laughs> oh my god! It's like spiritually, is that a French accent? <laughs> That's not Charlie Sargent. Sorry. Smash. Like, what? <laughs> oh god, I can't even pull up a. I'm so tired. I can't even do a Charlie Sargent. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. Okay. We gotta. Uh, we gotta move on to the the old National Alliance. Uh, pick it up. All right. So, man. Yeah, I guess this was it. This Fine. is it. Yeah. <laughs>